So these are the words of the Lord Buddha, spoken on occasion <coughs> with a, a gathering of laity, uh, trying to arouse a sense of urgency uh, so that they can awaken to Dharma practice. <coughs> and, that on, and that on occasion, a young man uh, did attain the Dharma Rai uh, after hearing such verses. And so when on such a gathering of people as they were in the time of the Buddha preparing to do dana, and it must have been a very auspicious occasion uh, to have the Buddha uh, coming to your house or to a gathering and uh, a great honor and his fame was widely renowned and even so in other religious scriptures they are recorded of such a such a being a Samma, some Buddha has arisen in the world and in the time of India they they uh, know it in the scriptures but have very little understanding and so they were incredibly uh, excited so as his fame increased it uh, people would come from far and abroad places to come and hear the Buddha's teachings and so many uh, gained such great benefits and happiness so uh, we have to consider our own state of our mind and uh, so we are establishing yoni so manasa karota that is wise consideration and to be established in wise uh, consideration or considering or bringing the mind to attention we have to first have a sense of uh, giving ear as the Lord Buddha said if we don't even give ear then how can we uh, then see if this if this is beneficial or not so we are giving it uh, a chance or opportunity to uh, listen in a very neutral way and uh, and uh, and later on also to consider it over again <coughs> And so there is no fire like lust, the Lord Buddha said, and there is no crime like hate. And these two I've put on the logo because they're continuing on the theme of craving and aversion. And uh, it's a very important theme because these are two extremes which the Lord Buddha, uh, in his first discourse, told us to avoid. And uh, I think the implications of that are far-reaching, more far-reaching that we can imagine. <clears throat> so I'm going in great detail on these aspects and how uh, they are of the nature of desire. <clears throat> and the other two verses, and they are, there is no ill like that of this body or the five candors. And that's a very beautiful verse and those who are well versed in Dharma practice will agree, yes, this body is a mass of suffering. It's something that's subject to aging, decay, sickness, and constant change and flux. It's so difficult to maintain a sense of happiness all the time with the world around us and seeking joy and happiness is our vocation. And it's normal for beings who are lacking Dharma to look externally for happiness. <coughs> and that's the final verse, no bliss higher than that of uh, peace and uh, and it's not just a sense of peace because if it was just a sense of peace then of course we would we would say yep I prefer bliss but this is referring to a peace where there is no there is no craving or aversion and this is a true happiness that we still don't understand and takes much time so really when we're in a normal state of mind and suddenly uh, something exciting happens how quickly we are to get excited and joyful about it. And if something happens that's uh, not so exciting and uh, annoying, how quickly we, we go the other extreme. <clears throat> so this is showing our mind as it is, uh, still needing much training. So good morning and welcome to the BSV Sunday Dharma Talk and today is the 25th of February 2018. My name is Ajahn Katapunyo and I've prepared a, 
a little shrine uh, just to show respects to my lineage. I'm from uh, the Wapapong lineage, uh, that is from the Lumpur Cha lineage in Thailand, and, uh, and I've come seeking uh, a dwelling close to the city because I have some, uh, uh, some uh, urgent matters to look after regarding family, and the BSV have been very welcoming and hospitality to me, so I'm more than to the BSV and the community, and also vast from me, uh, which is a great honour to do some teachings. <coughs> So, how are, all, how are we all? So we can ask ourselves, how are we feeling at this present moment? And what is our experience right now? Are we aware? Have we a sense of knowing? <clears throat> can we recognize uh, a sense of uh, the quality of Dharma within us? You know, we have uh, the right frame of mind to, to uh, listen to Dharma. We are, we're not worried about our iPhone, and, and even if it vibrates, we're not getting excited wanting to reach out and look for it. Can we, can we, can we see, test ourselves? My phone vibrates in my pocket. Can we say no? This is a great test for one hour. Can we just give full attention to what we are doing? And this is a rare hour, I think, in the modern world to do that. <laughs> so... Uh, so then, as we consider Dharma and our experience and take stock of all our understanding of Dharma, can we say that we are understanding Dharma? And a lot of us might say, no, I'm still getting frustrated trying to understand Dharma. And some of us might say, not sure. And others will say, maybe. And, uh, and those who have been practicing for a long time will start to say with uh, much conviction, yes. And, uh, and this is very good. So this, this is the nature of Dharma. It does take time. Uh, we are not like uh, disciples and the laity of the time of the Buddha, listening to one talk and they attain the Dharma eye, which is so hard to gain. So it just shows uh, how much uh, uh, qualities these people had at the time of the Buddha, you know, how much great uh, qualities of mind that were that just suddenly could be just so that open and understanding of the Dharma. <clears throat> so now it's time to bring our attention to listen carefully and uh, consider uh, this, this uh, ongoing theme I'm using on non-conflict and, uh, and uh, going with uh, underlying theme of craving and aversion. <clears throat> so previously I spoke about the mechanics of the mind that are under the sway of ignorance, and that is of craving and aversion. <coughs> Thus, aversion is a negative form and also a positive form. <coughs> so we can see the positive form being craving and the negative form being aversion. So it's seated in desire, as I mentioned before, and desire is the name in Pali, Tanha. And we have Bhava Tanha and Vibhava Tanha. And this was spoken in the first discourse. And uh, this is one aspect he was trying to point out of these two extremes to avoid. So Bhava Tanha is that of becoming. So it's a sense of that even when we are now dying bed, we wish to be living in heaven forever and forever. And this is the quality of our notion of how much craving we have and security that even when we're dying we're still looking for security and that's the notion of bhava tanha and then we have the other extreme which is vibhava tanha which is a negation of bhava becoming and that is not to become and for those atheists of the world who are uh, who smirk at any religious or philosophical ideas and say at the end, that's it. It's just a bag of bones. And so this is the most dangerous view, the Lord Buddha said, for there's no danger or no harm that person can do. Because someone who has no uh, uh, viewpoint and such uh, understanding of Dharma and thinks that this body is just 
just one thing, just a physical thing, and that all I do is just seek pleasure and make sure I have food and uh, not concerned about anything else. So it's a very selfish view of the world. And so very scientific, and they can prove it very well. Well, you know, there is no heaven. If there is, how? let's prove it scientifically. But there are some things science cannot prove. And more and more things, the science, as it gets much more refined, are starting to see the Lord Buddha's truth. And one of them was water. When they went to Mars, what were they looking for? They were looking for water because science have come to this evaluation about life and all life form needs water. And this is what said Lord Buddha, as life is sustained by water. <clears throat> the origination of the world will be one of the first primary aspects will be of that of water. <clears throat> and the degeneration de de of the world and that would be the primary aspect of the lack of water. So, uh, whether these heaven or hells exist, we don't know. But taking the view of uh, this is just merely a bag of bones in the dust in a scrap of heap, then what is the need for even putting flowers where the, where the deceased one has died if it's just that? We don't really care. And what's, what's the point of it all? We can have this such a strong... Uh, uh, cold view of things and therefore what actions will we do what will be the basis of our action if life is like that there is no evil that we will do because we have no right or wrong inside of us internally so if we feel we want to do something extreme what is it to stop us but when we have Dharma teachings and the Lord Buddha says there is such a thing as karma and vipaka karma fruits of our action so we have to consider, if we do certain things, they will bring harm to us. And a lot of people say, well, that's not true. Look at criminals, they get away with everything. And where's the fruit of their karma? But then, sadly enough, people misunderstand this. And so when someone goes knocking on their door, and they're living in their lovely palace, and they have their Mercedes and their gold chains, and the latest armory to protect them, what is the first thing they reach? It is their gun. They're thinking, who is it that's come to get my wealth? But then someone who is a Dharma practitioner and they're at home and again the door knocks and their heart is generous and open. And what is the thing they were seeing? How can I help? Who is it that's come? Who is, in, who is in need of support? And so because this Dharma practice is so rare and special so this fundamental aspect of karma is absolutely important. And so these five precepts that we've taken here is giving support to that and allowing us to mature. And with this maturation, we will have a steady mind because we are training the mind to go majjhima patipada, the middle way. If we don't have the middle day, then what do we have? We have these two extremes to rely on as our refuge, craving and aversion. And they're working on us all the time. One minute we have the notion of incre incredibly excited and love things and the other times we have this incredible uh, disliking for things. And it goes on and on, turning uh, to every point of reference in life. <clears throat> now why do they control us? And why is our experience of the world under the control of craving inversion? And it's just these very kilesas that pull us into a subjective world, worldly view. And subjective meaning my view, or your view, or their view. Wherefore an objective view is a standpoint, it's not my view. We can stand apart, it's not their view. We can stand to a place of middle, middleness. And we can look at it in a very objective way without getting too emotionally involved in it. It's here that the automotive response we see of craving aversion taking its power. And this very nature of this automotive response is the very quality of desire that's deeply embedded in us. And so then when, for example, our knee kicks forward, if we tap it, uh, such as when we go to the clinic and the doctor checks the reflex of the knee and it kicks forward. And we can see that we didn't command the knee to kick forward, but it went forward. Isn't it amazing? I did not plan that and it just went forward. And then suddenly someone comes up 
and abuses us and tell us we're a dog. And straight away we get all upset and annoyed. And that is an automotive response of aversion. And so when the mind is not ready to receive such things, it just quickly reacts. Before we know it, we're all upset. And we, don't, and we quickly justify it to build on. And when we justify it, we make it even worse. And Lumpur Cha, uh, the great master of our tradition, said these things when a gathering of lay people. <clears throat> a lay person came up and was very upset because people were calling him a dog or so forth. And Lumpur Cha laughed at him. He says, oh, is that true? They call you a dog. So that means you have a tail. And then straight away the man realized what a fool he was. <laughs> and all the audience there were laughing. And that's how it is. If we know the doctor is about to, uh, let's say, test our knee, and we can, we can play a little trick on the doctor, and we can deliberately stop the leg going forward. I've done that with myself, done a test before doing this talk, got someone to tap my knee. Actually, I didn't, and my knee didn't go forward because I was there in, in, uh, in test, in, uh, ready for its reaction. And that's what Lumpur Chah is saying. As soon as those words come, we're ready to catch them and to put them in their proper context of Dharma. Oh, they call me a dog. Fine. Do I have a tail? No. And we can remain happy and light-hearted. Because beings are the owners of their karma. So as us, as Dharma practitioners, we should be very patient. We should not react. We should use Dharma as our stronghold. And this will be a great refuge and security for us and a great example for society. So this is just a little analogy of the quality of aversion, how quickly it arises in the mind. <coughs> and again, on the other knee, which, is, which you can say is not the other extreme, but we will use it as an example because we have two legs. So one leg is craving and one leg is aversion. So if we tap the other leg, it's the same response, and it's the response of desire. And what is that response? That is the response of the other extreme, which is craving. And we can look at it in a sense of if somebody suddenly just grabs you very hard and grabs your hand very tightly and pulls on it, you feel a bit uh, uncomfortable. But then suddenly if somebody grabs the other hand very gently, soothing it and stroking it, you feel very much attracted to that and you want to be averse to the person grabbing it so hard. And that's very true. And, but then there's all the mental proliferations that go with it. Oh, who's trying to harm me? Or oh, who's trying to make me feel pleased and excited? And then we get infatuated with one and we get annoyed with the other, and so on and so on. Again, this is so quick, it's happening a split second in the mind, like that, just like a click of a finger, as an example. So it's very hard to catch. And that's why we should be doing our most endeavours to remain in our evenness and middleness, prepared for everything that arises in our daily life and observe what is happening within ourselves. <coughs> Truly our experience of the world are hindered. And what are they hindered of? They are hindered by our unwise attention. So when we don't have this serpent wise attention, then when somebody taps our knee, we can't stop it from kicking forward. But if we know they're going to do it, we can decide, no, I don't want that leg to go forward. I'll remain it still. We're catching those automotive responses of going towards craving and aversion. <coughs> and what is it that hinders us and blocks us? from the wholesome state of mind. And wholesome states of mind are that much of being evenness of mind, being in a state of neutrality. And so when we're in a state of neutrality, it sounds boring. But as we more and more uh, develop it, we, we see this quite special quality. It actually relaxes and calms us. And that's the quality of neutrality. And that's what we're doing with meditation. We're calming the mind down and just becoming aware and for a lot of people, this seems very boring. But as we get better out of it, we really start to see the benefits. We start to be able to think more clearly. We start to have more evenness of moods. And we have more understanding of ourselves. 
and so forth. <coughs> so these five hindrances that are blocking us from attaining this state of neutrality, what are they? And they are this, this thing of being kalesis, and the kalesis all at, all at work here. <coughs> they are controlling us <coughs> to behave in certain ways. And what is this word kilesa for a lot of people who are not so familiar with Buddhist terms? And that is defilements. And defilements means a stain in the mind. <coughs> now we consider these two hindrances of the five nivaranas. <coughs> and these five nivaranas, we will consider these two, and these two uh, encompass what, what do you think? They encompass, again, craving and aversion. So we have one extreme, karma chanda. And uh, chanda being that of the... Uh, desire, aspiration, and karma, meaning that of uh, karma kun, which is sensuality. So that's the desire for sensuality. And, and what is sensuality? And that is we're seeking beautiful sights, lovely sounds, lovely tastes, fragrant odors, lovely tactile sensations, and, and mental uh, thoughts, fantasies, emotions that are pleasing, that we like to entertain. <clears throat> so this seems very harmless because, you know, we're just making ourselves happy. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the quality of karma chanda reels us in, so we go deeper and deeper into it until we are lost in sensuality and we don't even know ourselves. And it maybe it even creates harm on ourselves. <clears throat> and so w looking at this, what is the hinder that blocks the unwholesome, <clears throat> and we can see, now we consider that these two hindrances, such as karma chanda, and the other one, which is bayapada, and bayapada is the opposite, and that is ill will, where we're lacking goodwill. For if we lack goodwill, we are ill will. And this is a state of negative of the mind. So what are the qualities of karma chanda? What, did it, uh, what are its workings of it, as we can say? And there are three aspects of it. And that is uh, uh, raga, tanha, and rati. The three aspects of karma chanda. And the first one being raga, which is the strongest of them, and that is lust. And lust can be understood as, uh, as a desire for uh, a partner and so forth. Or it can be understood as a uh, strong desire for life or desire for fun. So it has many connotations, but unfortunately, usually it's referred to desire for a partner or relationships and so forth. And, uh, and the other one, tanha, which is desire for sensuality, uh, all kinds such as lovely sights, lovely, uh, uh, lovely uh, uh, feelings and sensations. <clears throat> And the third one, which is rati, which is infatuation and delight. Now these things in themselves are just desire, and they are, but it's what we do with them, how we interact with them, and we look at them in a certain light. <clears throat> and thus we are lost in the essential desires. And why? Because of the sign of beauty. So there is this sign we're looking at them, as being very beautiful. And because they are enticing and very beautiful, we cannot deny that. <clears throat> but there is another aspect which I'll further on talk about, and then we'll look at now, which is uh, the unwholesome states of mind, which is ill will. <clears throat> now with that, there's qualities of anger, cruelty, and hatred, and so on. And hatred being the strongest of them all. So with the qualities of uh, ill will, we lack goodwill and we are in a state of aversion. <clears throat> so again, when we see these qualities uh, come about in our mind, they come because of signs and features. They are defined by signs and features. So therefore, the sight of sensuality will have the sign of beauty and the sight of uh, ill will will have the sign of the repulsiveness. So when we're in the middle, just staying within ourselves, 
we still have desire, even though we're not going to these extremes, but we are ready. And this is a response, such as a tapping of the knee. So then how quickly we respond to the world around us. So then if we see some beautiful flowers, we say, oh, they are so beautiful. And we ask a friend, aren't they beautiful? And our friend says, they're okay. So we can see the eye, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it is a, truly is a subjective view. How we see things as a sign of beauty will depend on each person. But we cannot deny there is the aspect of beauty about it, the aspect of attraction. And then if we look at uh, another situation where we're going to the cemetery to put flowers on a deceased relative and we put some uh, Oh, we see the old flowers there, and that's a sign of repulsion. We try to get rid of them, throw them away in the dirt. Nobody wants these old rotten flowers. And then we put the new flowers, and we feel pleased and happy. And this is a very nice, lovely gesture to do on deceased relatives. But if we look at it on that perspective, how we, how we engage in seeing these two situations of flowers nice or flowers old and smelly and whatnot, then we are seeing how strong the mind is by us. I remember one occasion when I was Tudong, wandering with another monk, and we stayed at this very old, rotten, old sala, being this large sort of like uh, building, and uh, some people would come for the weekend to listen to our teachings and uh, receive alms food, and uh, the pictures of uh, famous Ajans and teachers were all old and rippled and crumpled, and the other monk was totally at ease, where I had the sign of, this is disgusting, you know, these are great teachers, how can we have to fix them up? And he said to me, it's a Nichang, it's a state. And then I looked at it and said, oh, that's so true. And then my mind state changed and I looked at the picture and I thought, and I just looked at the peeling and the cobwebs and all the colour, the stain going away, and I looked at it in a totally different view. And I could see how biased my mind was, it got up in a mood of aversion. So we have to always check ourselves with these simple little tests when we go to the funeral to put nice flowers and old flowers. We don't get annoyed with the ugly flowers, but it's reminding us of the state of impermanence. And we should actually even get more sense of uh, joy. It's a true joy because it's a joy secluded from sensuality. It's a joy of Dharma, realizing Dharma. And this brings more joy than just seeing beautiful flowers, because that is just a fleeting thing, because next week they'll be all rotten, and then, then where is our sign of beauty? We have to go looking for it. But Dharma is always joyful to look at, so when we see the sign of impermanence and we're peaceful, we can be truly joyful, because we're seeing the truth of life in a very standpoint of an objective view, and we're maturing in our being as a, as a human being on this earth. <coughs> So this is, we're just looking a little bit in defining these two uh, features and how we define them is through wise attention. So if we don't have wise attention, which is Yaniso Manasakarota, then desire will wreak havoc on our mind. So then therefore we have the five precepts. So if we have the desire to harm something, which is a, which is a strong aversion, then we say, no, I won't. And then we see, instead we say, we give uh, non-harming and freedom to others. And this is the same if someone tries to harm us, we won't harm them back because if they harm us, they are harming them, they are doing more harm to themselves than me. And it's great recorded by the great teachers. Uh, one great Ajahn was traveling in a boat and, uh, and there was a notorious thief on the prowl and, uh, and this Ajahn was uh, resting in Samadhi and saw the thief in his mind's eye going through all his luggages and stealing and then straight away he realized oh this is a very evil action this man is doing and, oh this is terrible consequences that he's going to have so straight away what he did to reduce the heavy karma that poor man would be experiencing in future lives he renounced those objects so when he left the boat he left all his belongings behind and only just with the robes he was wearing so this is showing the extent of how much we are we are concerned about our own welfare and the welfare of others. And this is such a fine example of how we can do. So when someone is, uh, uh, of course, damaging our property, which is not nice, and we get upset, 
but sometimes we just have to make sure we look after it properly so then people we don't allow, we don't give them, we don't tempt people to uh, damage our property. But still we should always look at things in the light of that it's impermanent and not to get too caught up in it. <clears throat> And again, wise attention, we will look at this quality of ill will. And what is it doing? It's harboring ill will. And again, we'll look at karma chanda. And what is that developing? We're developing in this quality of being lost in sensuality. So they're very strong pulls and pushes that are working all the time. So now we will look at a group of uh, defilements that exists between these two extremes and I'll go into great detail in them and this will give us an understanding how we can use craving and aversion with certain uh, defilements which we are all aware of and I, will, and I will name them and I'll give examples of them. And the first one which I'll give is Mitaria. <clears throat> now this one is meaning strong greed and strong greed has the quality of, as it's translated in Pali, stinginess and selfishness. And what are we stingy and what are we selfish about? And it's about our own wants. So it's a quality of desire, going to craving. And what are our attachments? Our attachments are for those things of that we desire. And what is that is, is our obsessions and that is our craving. And what is its nature? And its nature is of selfishness. So we can see all these qualities are very unwholesome. But that doesn't stop it from arising. It's very difficult to change. And then we see another aspect of the aversion aspects of it, and that is other people come into this equation. As soon as other people come around, we get a bit afraid because maybe uh, uh, they want the same thing, or maybe uh, I'm going to the supermarket looking to get my groceries, and other people, I'm competing with other people, and I'm trying to get the best things. and. Uh, and there, there we see it, you know, we're not sharing with our humankind, we're thinking, I deserve it better than them. So then we can see an old lady, here, you, you pick first. We can always show that quality. And this is so important in our Dharma practice. This Lord Buddha said is the one that is uh, the foundation of our Dharma practice, is ridding one ourselves of stinginess. <clears throat> So with this quality of understanding that and fear of others taking our property or taking our possessions and, uh, or things that we are seeking in the world or competing with other things, we can uh, at the, be the standpoint and thinking that um, they too want happiness like me, so let's share. And we should have that quality of sharing. And sometimes we even, even go to a much more lofty happiness in thinking, let them have it all and I will get the happiness of dana of sharing. <clears throat> so then we will uh, see this scale and a spectrum of a scale so therefore we can look at it there is the black and white and the black being aversion and the white being uh, a craving. So we can see this one even though there's a lot going towards craving there's definitely an aspect of it of aversion so it's going towards aversion. So it's neither one or the other. <clears throat> now we'll consider envy. Now envy is also uh, a very interesting kilesa, and a lot of us didn't think it was a kilesa. We would say, oh no, it's not a kilesa. Envy is admiration, quality of, oh I envy them, you know, they're great, they're, they're wonderful. How can that be a kilesa? But it is, because we go into the nature of craving and we're denying our own abilities. <clears throat> and we can see this with young adults and young children. When they see the superheroes, they put on their costume and they play and envying them and going saving the hero. They desire to be like them. And this is, uh, this is a great I think because we're admiring, aspiring to be someone very good, saving people and beating up the bad guy. Unfortunately, the one bad thing is we're beating up the bad guy, which the superhero shouldn't really do. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, that's the limitation of worldly dharmas. <clears throat> So then we have this looking at envy and seeing uh, the quality of um, this admiration. <clears throat> so this admiring is a wonderful quality. And then as we grow up and we're teenagers, we're in our room playing with our guitar and singing our 
favorite heroes' rock, uh, pop songs. And this is uh, as we mature. And then as we begin our professional life, we then admire our, our maybe our executive manager, how, how professional, how skilled he is. So it's a quality of uh, admiration for him. And uh, so it's, we're looking at him in a very positive light. So, but then we're also undermining our own abilities, which is very sad. So we should not get too caught up in envy. And when people do, they tend to uh, be much like closing themselves and locking themselves in the closet, thinking I'm no good at anything. And, uh, and this is uh, where uh, the dark little aspect of where it's, where is a tinge of it going to the aversion towards our own abilities. <clears throat> So now we will consider one notch up from envy. And this one is, we can say, envy is the preparation for a nasty kind of a kilesa. So as uh, we're young children and young adults, it's natural to feel qualities of envy in our life. And this is how we start to develop a role model for ourselves and how we will behave and how we will develop ourselves into the world. But unfortunately, when we compete with others and we learn we have to compete because the world is the way it is. It is run by the worldly dharmas. So these worldly dharmas, which we have to all compete with, and the Lord Buddha said to us to remain in the middle, not to be caught up in them. <clears throat> so there's a quality of where people are giving us praise. And when we get praise and recognition in a job, we get a better, better status in the job, our income increases. And with that income increases, we are looking for uh, uh, much more status and with that status and seeking more happiness and so on. But if it goes the other way where we're getting uh, criticized and uh, even get the sack, so to speak, then our wealth decreases and we're concerned about our wealth and prosperity. And then because of that, our status goes down and also we worry about our our, our well-being, we, we get in a state of much suffering. So we can see it's always going like this in the worldly dhammas. We're going up and down. And that way, the Lord Buddha says to be uh, very mindful and aware that if we get praise, fine. If someone blames me, fine. I'm just doing the best I can. And uh, sometimes we don't deserve blame, but we get it. So we have to be ready to, uh, to weather the storm of worldly dhammas. <clears throat> And this quality of envy, which is uh, very much caught in these worldly dharmas, and that's where its strong, po strong, strong point is for it having on our minds, is that we're competing and we're seeking to get recognition and fame. Where, for example, I myself doing a dharma talk, I feel it is my duty and service. And if I was to think, wow, how famous I'm going to get. Uh, last week I've only had 30 people, now I've got... Uh, 60, next week I want 100 people, and on and on, my head grows bigger and bigger. And this is not correct. This is not what the Lord Buddha advised monks, how we should teach Dharma. We should teach from the point of helping and benefiting others. <clears throat> so we can see this quality and we consider jealousy. Now, what is the usual scenario of jealousy? And jealousy has this usual scenario, and that is, it's not fair. I deserve that. I deserve to win, and so forth, and so on. And what do we throw out the window? We throw out envy, our admiration for that person. And why? Because we are living in a competitive world. Because if I don't get it, they're going to get it. And this also we can see qualities of uh, macharya, stinginess, sneaking in as well. <clears throat> so then it's all very overwhelming, and everyone's doing it. So that's why we all do it. But that doesn't, doesn't mean that it's right. So as Dharma practitioners, we feel we are getting, uh, let's say, because we are patient and calm and serene, it seems like people run, trot all over us, but doesn't mean we can't stand up and, uh, and, exp and point out what is right and wrong and be patient in doing so. So, uh, <clears throat> and what do we throw out? As I said, the envy. And why do we do that? It's because we want to step in their shoes. Wherefore, before, when we're envious, we never thought of stepping in the shoes. We always honoured our heroes and thought they were idols. We would pin them on our wall. But when we're jealousy and the other person gets our job, for example, do we pin them on our wall? No, we use them as a dartboard. 
So we can see the nature of these chalices, how truly dangerous they are. <clears throat> And so with these uh, defilements of mine, the story of jealousy goes on and on. And we say to ourselves, oh, we missed out, or we lose out what, they, what we wanted. And then it's they and you, and what do they want? And this is how it goes on. What they want, they want that nice office, and they want that uh, uh, lovely new computer, or they want that uh, secretary, so I don't have to check 100 emails a day and so forth. So I can have enjoyment and I can have also uh, my own chauffeur and my own car. And these are things, uh, of course, uh, conveniences and maybe we deserve them. But uh, we can see when we don't get them how quickly we are the mind festers in jealousy trying to compete and get something we feel we could do a better job than them. <clears throat> and now the dark aspect of, uh, uh, of this uh, jealousy, we think we desire that or what they have. And so then what, we, what are we considering then? We're considering how can we get them out of the equation. So we look at this equation, one times one, and what does it equal? And what is this equation? Craving times aversion. And what does that equal? It equals jealousy. Because it's neither craving or aversion. They are pulling us apart. So one minute we're in craving for wanting that lovely office and that lovely chauffeur and that nice car and having a secretary to help answer all our emails. And on the other end, we're aversion to them who've got all those things that we deserve, we worked hard for. So this is the quality of what we're looking in the competing world, and we're seeing that all around us. Whether it's just going to the supermarket, competing to get the, the best veggies, or, or competing on a level in our, in our work, or competing in sports where we're playing, uh, where we're quite not a, a gentleman in sport, we're a sore loser, and we even... Uh, elbow them in the, in the hip or uh, give them an uh, undercut and uh, get them all knocked out on the ground as we see in the football many times. How many times the football, footballers are sad losers and they beat each other up? You know, this is, this is a showing the power of jealousy. <clears throat> so it truly is a dangerous quality of the mind and there's so much mental proliferation goes around it. So when we go home, from our office, we brew over it for a week's on end. And every time we see them, we see them in the light of aversion. And every time we look at that office, we see we pine with great craving. So how do we eradicate this jealousy? Well, we can see this is a very excellent defilement to see the true dharma. And that's what defilement's all about. It helps us to see the true dharma. So then if we see that they win such a thing, we can decide which are we going to take out, the like or the dislike, because this is the fundamental basis for, for, for uh, <clears throat> this to arise in the mind. For if there is going to be jealousy, it needs this quality of like and dislike. This is its fundamental aspect for it to arise. <clears throat> so then we say to our friend, instead of uh, uh, having this aversion, please take the office. Please, you have it. I want you to be comfortable. I'm, I'm, I'm content. In, I, you know, it's, I'm doing my job. If I deserve it, I, you know, people will recognize I'm doing a good job and they will you know, appoint me and so forth and I will do my duty. So when the monk, two monks are here and, uh, and one monk gets to do more Dharma, talk, Dharma talks and more time to uh, teachings, and if the monk is not very well balanced in his Dharma practice, he can get very jealous and thinking, here is me in my room practicing dharma, but I'm brewing in jealousy. <laughs> but then that way, the other monk could say, oh, Anamorana, you're doing such a lovely job. And then now I have more time to refine my dharma practice. And when the time comes, they too, I will be asked to give some dharma reflections. And this is how we approach even it as a dharma practice, practitioner, because jealousy creeps in everywhere, you know. It's the most nastiest of all defilements. And this is what stories, movies, novels, and newspapers are full of. And this is what makes life very interesting. So when we understand jealousy like this, who wants jealousy? Nobody wants jealousy. What, what, so much trouble and distress and worry, agitation in the mind, I don't really want it. So then we start to think is in Dharma. Let's look at this equation. Okay, I'll take out the craving. No, let's, let's take out the aversion. So, we're averse to uh, them getting what they have. So then we say to them, please, I want you to have it. 
and uh, and all we uh, crave for what uh, they have, and we say, I don't want that office. And we say, no, I'm content with what I have. And this is what the law would have said, contentment is, is, the, is the abiding that leads us to peace. Because when we are at ease, then desire has calmed down. We don't need this or that. And this is the first fundamental aspect before we can attain peace. We need contentment. For if the mind is not at ease and peace, it will go out seeking for desire. And which desire it looks for? And that is craving. That's the power of craving, pulling us all the time. <clears throat> so if we have these little victories in our life, then we have a little bit of standpoint of a personal perspective of Dharma. And we can see that when we do let go of these strong defilements, what is there? There is peace in the mind. <clears throat> now we'll take it to another extreme. For example, <clears throat> if, for example, we were jealous, and, uh, and such as in newspaper headings, and a person, or not ourselves, such as a person got so jealous and so up, uh, worked up, he would begin to start to boil with, what do you think? Great ill will. And where would that ill will take him? To great hatred. And the quality of hatred, as the Lord Buddha says, is the quality of being boiled up oneself. And that's what it feels like. We feel like we're really boiling with hate. And that's why when people with so much aversion, they express it to others because they're in so much suffering. It's not because they want to harm other people, but they are suffering so much. And that's why they're harming others because they're trying to express their own harm, their, the pain and suffering they have. So then when we engage also getting angry and, hot and, and fighting back, we make it even worse. So it's, 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 a, it's a disease which we can't get rid of, the Lord Buddha said. So we have to use not worldly dharmas to get rid of it, but we use the dharma itself, the true dharma, to deal with these things. <clears throat> So being patient and uh, poised and, uh, and uh, having the qualities of contentment with what we have. And then when we see straight away the mind's still thinking about the office. So it's going to take time to develop contentment. But the more we work on it, slowly, slowly we see the craving for that will go down and down. And this is what the five precepts is all about. Because if it's not ours, it's not given us, then it's then it's adinadana, that has not been given to us. So why are we thinking about it? We are breaking the second precept, if we are truly sincere. On a level of refinement, that's what the precept means. Even if something on a level of jealousy, if something's been given to another person, we feel we are right to have it, we have no right to it because it's not been given to us. So why are we being jealous? We are breaking our precepts. And this is where the precepts are so invaluable when we look at them in a very deep perspective. And then the Dharma truly arises in our mind, and then we abandon such heavy defilements of the jealousy. And what do we have when we abandon it? But for that person who doesn't abandon it and goes on and on, boiling with hatred, what do you think he will do? It's quite clear. Look at the movies. We have the good guy and the bad guy. And the bad guy, what does he want? He wants to harm the good guy. And uh, usually he's so angry that he'll even, even bring his life to an end. And let's say he does do that, he achieves that, and he gets uh, the, the, the uh, beautiful princess or whatever the movie story is about. And there he is in his castle, got rid of the, the old king, and now he's taken over, he has a princess, he has all the people. How does he feel? And I can tell you a story of the time of the Buddha. There was a, a, a very famous king under the power of, a, of, a, of, a, of an evil uh, uh, evil monk of who had very unwholesome desires to, uh, for power. He was uh, incredibly obsessed with power. And so he told this, this uh, king or this prince to, to, uh, to harm his father because his father was not allowing him to become the king. And so if the prince harmed his father or end his life, then this monk would have the power of that kingdom and everything he desired would be under his control of that king. So whatever he wanted, he could get through that king. And this is incredibly evil and unwholesome. And so when the, when the prince, under the sway and influence, being a young prince and not, and not understanding Dharma and uh, caught in such a, a, a wrong understanding, he even harmed, believed the monk and harmed his father. 
And so doing so, <coughs> when his father died, and that very day his father died, King Asaju, very, very famous king, and uh, the, who uh, took over from his father, King Bimbasara, then uh, his wife gave birth to a child. And then he straight away realized, just before his father was being tortured to death, he realized, stop, stop, don't kill my father, because I have a son. Now I'm a father too. Now I understand the love that my father had. And when the child was born, King Asaju was born, the, Lord, uh, the, the, the great Brahmins uh, predicted that this child would bring great harm to him. And uh, he said that you should, not, uh, you should not keep this child. This child is very dangerous. And, says, and, the, and the king said, King Bibara said, no, if, it, if I will love him as much as I would love uh, my own child, I could never, if he harms me, uh, I, I, won't, I won't be angry with you, happy, because I love my child, my son. And so this is how King Bimbisara, when the commandments of his prince, he had not even one ill thought, ill will thought towards his son, the prince, who was uh, ordering the men, the soldiers, to harm him. <clears throat> and so this is uh, the level of, uh, uh, we see, once the father, King Bimbisara, passed away, King Asaju was in a great, dis great distress and woe. And this evil monk also met uh, his great evil end as well and died in a, very, uh, uh, in, a, in a very bad way because of all the evil he did. <clears throat> and so this uh, prince went to see Sariputta and Sariputta had a long conversation with him, which is a very, uh, a very uh, important monk of the Lord Buddha. And they went to see the Lord Buddha, and, uh, and then he took on vows to become a Buddhist, supporting the Buddhist cause, and saw uh, that he could not change what he did, and he accepted that. And because of that, he could not attain Sotapanna. And so therefore, you know, we can see how dangerous hatred is. So we should never allow it to arise. And if it does, we have to really quickly do our best to avoid it because it is so dangerous, and the, no the novels, books, movies are full of it. So when the bad guy uh, takes the good guy out of the equation, does he feel good about it? No, he doesn't. And actually, in the end, he probably doesn't even want the princess, because she doesn't love him anyway. She loves the good guy. So no matter how much he tries, she'll never love him. So he gets more and more annoyed and realizes that all that jealousy was a, was a true, uh, was a trickery of defilements. Uh, bringing us down and ruining us. And that's what the Tavalmans do. They ruin us in every way they can. So, and this is the power of desire when we're under its sway. So we are looking for a quality of Kusala Chanda. And this is a desire, a, a unique quite, uh, a kind of desire, which we are new to, and that is Dharma practice is all about wholesome desires. Desires and aspirations for true peace and happiness free from defilements and slowly reducing our defilements in our mind and coming to this midpoint of Majjhima Patipata, avoiding these two extremes truly in everything we do. So I'll give you a small footage of a famous scene in the Lord Buddha uh, of a story of uh, Lady Uttara, a great devotee of the Lord Buddha. And this scene depicts great jealousy. So uh, I talked in depth about jealousy and, uh, and so it's uh, showing the importance of it and, uh, and the qualities. And there's another aspect of jealousy also I'll just finalize before we go into it and that is the qualities of uh, resentment, the qualities of disdain and contemptuous. And these are qualities of resentment is blaming others, disdain is that we don't agree, we don't think they're good enough and also contemptuous, which is uh, the quality, they don't deserve it. And, and the most extreme of all these is that when they work all together, and that is we deny the good of others, and also we put down others when we shouldn't, when we, we have no real justification for it. So we should always check our minds and see what we are doing and see that we are in cord accordance with Dharma and the precepts which are helping us to develop our minds to true peace. So we'll go into the video now. Uttara, are you exhausted? Oh, dear husband.
husband. Uh, Miss Sirima. Look at her. Instead of letting others do the work, she's doing it all herself. Her face is dirty, her clothes are all soiled. She should be relaxing in a way fitting of her station, and instead she's finding ways of tiring herself out. Look at him. How heedless and indulgent he is. He thinks he's so rich that he has no need to make merit? Ah, oh, how very foolish he is. Look at Utero. She's looking at me with a smile of contempt. It's as if she's scolding me with her eyes. It's sickening. I'm not putting up with this. You. You. Utara, look at me. You want to fight? Well, you're going to get what you want. Sirima, I owe you a debt of gratitude because you agreed to take over my place as wife temporarily, allowing me to fulfill my wish to make merit. No matter how you treat me, I will not become angry or vindictive. Water, unable to hurt her. Hey! This prostitute is dared to attack our employer! Come on! Let's get her! Yeah, yeah, let's get her! Let's get her. Come, Come on, guys! Let's go! Let's go. All of you, don't hurt her. Sirima is like a friend to whom I owe a debt of gratitude. I am not angry with her. Courtesan, who you employed, I forgot myself and started imagining myself as your husband's wife, and so attacked you. But your heart is so noble. It is filled with loving kindness, and you have not shown me even the slightest amount of anger. I have wronged you. Please forgive me. Oh, get up, Sirima. If you want to ask for forgiveness, then you should ask it from the Lord Buddha, whom I revere above all others. Tomorrow I will have completed fifteen days of offerings. Please, come and offer food and listen to the Dhamma with me. A person should overcome anger with non-anger, overcome evil with goodness, overcome stinginess with generosity, overcome careless speech with words of truth. Those engrossed in worldly enjoyments, indulging in sense pleasures, intoxicated by wealth, social standing, extravagance, praise, rank, prestige, and power, cannot see the noble beauty of truth. I think the movie uh it beautifully points out some points I've been discussing, so we can use that as a reflection.